don't have any money to spare on other people, we don't have a lot. But there was a tremendous response. And you know what? Really, really encouraging. And it, it was really interesting because it was almost acting as a catalyst for him. What I mean by that is, as I think you mentioned, that they're looking to bring on board another 300 missionaries this, this year. And I think they have match funding for 150. And I, I, I think that uh, there was probably the potential for funding maybe at least 10, perhaps more, from this comparatively small congregation. And so that kind of acted as a catalyst to make you think, well, maybe the answer to the problem we already have is that now he's going to look for more churches to begin to speak at. Maybe we'll find out that he didn't have the answer, he only had us. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I do remember it. they went to a church once and for the first time there was spontaneous applause at the end of the address, but there was no large escort coming. <laughs> I'm going to tell you where it is. Um, anyway, it was also very encouraging to see somebody with youthful exuberance for a change. And here we are, back to the old gig. So it's a little bit like the peaks and troughs of your Christian life. Goes up and down, well we've been up and now we're coming down, but there's a constant line through it, which is the love of God. Thank goodness for that. So yes, uh, I'm sure we'll come back. Because there are many interesting stories of uh, what happens there. And I think that because it's been saturated in Bible worship for so many years, when I've been there, the one noticeable thing about it is the uh, very evident manifestation of demon possession that you get uh, when ministry begins at the end of services. It's very marked and very real. Um, let's pray. Oh, hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah. We thank you, mighty Thank you, Lord, for maintaining that 
faith which you have given us. We thank you, Lord God, that you have declared the good work that you began in us. You yourself will bring it to conclusion. And it will be for your glory. And you have declared that we shall be presented before you without spot or blemish. And with great joy, for you have done it. Oh Lord, we pray that your kingdom would come in us more and more. And Lord, as the wind has blown fiercely in these last few days, we are reminded of that scripture which says that the Spirit is like the wind that blows wherever it pleases. May it please you, mighty God, to send your Spirit to blow hard in this country, to destroy evil, Lord, and to raise up righteousness as only you can do. Oh, Lord God, we look around, we see and feel and understand the power of darkness, we see it, but Lord God, we know that when the light shines, the darkness must flee, so we praise you, mighty God, may we be found praising you in your holy name, for you have the victory over sin and death, and it shall never triumph, because you have defeated it. Help us, Lord, to remember these things, Lord God. And they praise the hour of that Help us to love one another, Lord, as you have loved us. So may we love one another and bear one another's burdens, Lord. We know that we have come to you this morning in different states of mind, perhaps with different problems and difficulties that we lay there, Lord God, at your door. And in the silence now, Lord, we Pray for those who are dear to us, Lord, and perhaps those who are enemies. We seek your grace for them, for those who are sick, Lord, for those who lack faith, Lord. We come before your great throne of grace in the name of Jesus. Thank you. 
terms of prophecy or people declaring the word of God, how do you tell the difference? What's the distinction between false prophets and true prophets? Over the ages, what do you think has been the mark? I think that one of the things is that False prophets, if you look at Jeremiah and Ezekiel, always declare peace and prosperity in the face of the actual prophecy of warning and judgment. The reason that the false prophets do that is because that's what people want to hear. Nobody in their right mind wants to hear about coming judgment. But false prophets speak in order to please the people that are gathered. The true prophet speaks not for his own honor, but for the one who sent him, which is why they are often despised. I want to read this as a remarkable piece of scripture, because at this juncture, the people of God are in exile. They've been driven out of their own country because of the fact that they've given themselves up to idolatry. And this is God's response. This is what, uh, again, the word of the Lord came to me, son of man. When the people of Israel were living in their own land, they defiled it by their conduct and actions. Their conduct was like a woman's monthly uncleanness in my sight. So I poured out my wrath on them because they had shed blood in the land and because they had defiled it with their idols. I dispersed them among the nations and they were scattered through the countries. I judged them according to their conduct and their actions. And wherever they went among the nations, they profaned my holy name. For it was said of them, these are the Lord's people. And yet they had to leave his land. I had concern for my holy name, which the house of Israel profaned among the nations where they had gone. Therefore say to the house of Israel, this is what the sovereign Lord says. It is not for your sake, O house of Israel, that I am going to do these things. But for the sake of my holy name, which you have profaned among the nations where you have gone, I will show the holiness of my great name, which has been profaned among the nations, the name you have profaned among them. Then the nations will know that I am the Lord, declares the sovereign Lord, when I show myself holy. How staggering is that? How staggering is that? That the very people that have brought the name of God into disrepute, that the very people that have profaned his name and caused nations to mock, they're the people that he's going to display his holiness through. That's a staggering thing. And, and is that kind of like the state of the church today? Has not the name of God been profaned? Is not the church responsible for siding frequently with the world? Does it not find itself making concessions and adjusting the gospel of Jesus Christ to suit the sin of man? I read something um, yesterday, in fact, about this tremendous headmistress in a very difficult London school, which she has transformed through really a process of rigorous discipline. And at one stage, her one of her parents is a born-again Christian. Do you know any of those? What, what are they anyway? <laughs> Who are these people? Weirdos. I mean, how ridiculous. What weird expression is that? 
What is a born again Christian? Jesus says, I tell you the truth, unless you are born again, you cannot see or enter the kingdom of God. So what other type of Christians are? Anyway, if the mother of this woman's a born again Christian, which is probably where this head teacher got this expression, she said that what she was trying to do was to teach her children to overcome the original sin to which they were born. There was an almighty furor about that. Everyone was up in arms. There was a storm. Little Johnny, born into original sin. Whoever heard of such a thing? This is the gospel. The world is so adamantly opposed to it that if you actually proclaim it as it is, you will find out whether or not what Jesus said is true. Whether or not you'll be persecuted for it. And the reality is, is that we are all born into sin. The New Testament doesn't declare something else. It doesn't say, no, that was only true in the Old Testament. Far from it. In fact, what it says about us, each one of us, is that the Apostle Paul declares this, that we were by nature objects of wrath. By nature, that's what we were born into because of the sin of Adam, who broke the covenant with God and allowed evil to enter. Now, I don't know about you. I, I don't know whether or not you recognize that in yourself, but I certainly do. I certainly recognize sin in myself. And I recognize that I do not have a natural predisposition towards righteousness. And what is sin? It is simply self. It is the desire to do whatever your nature wants to do. And what we found is that as the modern church has progressed, I don't know if that's the right word, perhaps regress would be better, that what we see is we see a growing denial of the doctrines of God. I was reading a survey the other day about evangelicals in America. And there were huge percentages of them that didn't believe in basic Christian teaching. For example, is there any other way to God outside of Christ? Well, 40% of evangelicals declared that there was. You could be uh, an adherent of Islam or Judaism. That would be ridiculous. Why would that be ridiculous? I've had people say to me, what you're telling me, there's a billion Muslims, they're all wrong, you're right, how arrogant is that? But I say this, it is extremely easy, and you do not need to be a theologian to dismiss all other religions. You simply have to be a human being and preferably a parent. Because if Jesus Christ is the only Son of God, Garden of Gethsemane when he is pleading to be released from drinking the cup of God's wrath, does he still have to go to the cross? That would make God a maniac, surely. To allow his son to suffer that for nothing. And this business of God's wrath, we don't like it. Who likes it? We'd have to be mad to like it. But by dismissing it, we have stripped the gospel of its power. And nobody's afraid of God because nothing's going to happen because God loves everybody and you as well, whatever you do. Where does it say that? What are you going to do? What are you going to do when you stand before God to give an account for the deeds done whilst in the body? What is my defense going to be? You know, this account of profaning God's name, that's me. I was a seriously bad man. I'm not that great now, to be honest, but perhaps I'm just the same person with the, the influence of God in my life is the truth of the matter. Because I recognize that I'm 
easily predisposed to going back to that which I once was, and that's where the tension and the conflict is. Before I was a Christian, I had no conflict. You me. Because I was always right, and everyone else was wrong. It's great. You know what? Sometimes I... No, I don't think you those who are not Christians, but they don't have a war to fight. They have no battle. They're not oppressed. Is a 
baptize with water. But the one who comes after me will baptize with fire. Jesus said, I have come to bring fire on the earth, and how distressed I am until my baptism is completed. So he came to bring something far more glorious than we've received. Seriously. Because if we received it, we would be filled with that inexpressible and glorious joy. Now take the disciples and look at their journey. And look at the amazing things that happened to them which were not capable of removing from them the heart of stone. Put yourself in their position. Imagine that you had been there when the 5,000 were waiting to be fed. And I love the fact that a little child comes up. And Andrew says, here's a little child with two fishes and five small barley loaves. But how far will they go among so many? I may have taken the child off of them. I'm sure Andrew didn't say, oh, give us those barley loaves and fish, we need them. In his innocence, unless you become like a little child who never entered the kingdom of heaven, you can't see it. In the child's innocence, he said, look at this, right? Which looks and seems ridiculous to the carnal life, but to the child who trusts, God is able to operate through. And so they fed the five thousand, as we know now. You're one of the disciples. You went around, you had the basket, you went and picked up all the pieces. That's another thing I'm always amazed about, that he bothers to pick up all the pieces. I mean, if you can do that, why bother? That's because we do not take things for granted that God gives us, nor do we allow them to go to waste. Anyway, having done that, basically what happens is, is that Jesus, and this is another amazing thing, he sends them off in a boat, the disciples. He goes up the mountain to pray on his own because the people want to make him king by force, and he doesn't want to be the kind of king that they want. How about that? We all want that kind of king, the one who can provide largesse and peace and prosperity every day of our lives. We all vote for that. That's what they wanted. But he knew he didn't come for that ministry. He came to change and transform them. Anyway, Jesus is walking across the water. The disciples see him. They're afraid. They allow him into the boat. And then the wind dies down. And they're amazed of what's going on. It says, because they hadn't understood about the loaves and the fishes. Why not? What's not to understand? It says because their hearts were hard. How about that? How about that? You know what? And it goes on and on. And you know what you see throughout the Gospels? You see the reality of original sin being played out. You see it in the man who's born blind. He symbolizes all of humanity. The disciples say, who sinned, this man or his parents that he was born blind? Neither this man nor his parents sinned. This happened so the work of God might be displayed in his life. Remember that. This is encouraging. How is it that sinners don't see their sinners? Because they are blind to reality. Who opens the eyes of the blind? Who can do that? Who can demonstrate to someone they're a sinner? God alone. Have you ever tried convincing someone they're a sinner? How many good people there are in this world? Find a bad one, please. I want to convert someone, or at least have someone do to me. Everyone declares themselves to be good because they're blind to the reality of what good is until God opens their eyes and convicts them of guilt through the Holy Spirit. Now he opens this man's eyes and he's an emblem of the transferring power of God who gives sight to the inly blind. So that the man is so transformed, I will show myself wholly through you before their eyes. He is so transformed that his neighbors don't recognize him. Some of them say he is the man. Others say no, he just looks like him. Shouldn't that be what people say about us? We're so transformed, I don't recognize him anymore. So generous and loving. by himself again. <laughs> and that, that is the transferring power of the Spirit. And yet the disciples, they're witnesses to these things. My dear friends, they're witnessing the glory of God. It's happening in their presence. And still, they remain blind to the glory of God. Staggering. You think people say, seeing is believing. If I saw this or that, then I would believe. Have you not heard people say 
such things? It's eminently untrue, because when Jesus himself is performing miracles, which in the end, they weren't even trying to refute. By the time he raised Lazarus from the dead, the Pharisees got fed up investigating the healings and being embarrassed and ridiculed, because that's what the man born blind did to them. That they had nowhere to go. And they made this remarkable declaration. They testified against themselves. Look at the demarcation between those who are controlled by evil and the righteous. The righteous being Jesus. Look what evil wants to do to righteousness even when it is going about doing good. He raises Lazarus from the dead and some of the Jews go tell the Pharisees and they proclaim, well where is this Gideon? Here is this man doing many miraculous signs. What's going to become of us? That's what people are interested in. They're not interested necessarily in the truth, but what is to be, what does it mean to them? For them, it meant their position of power and control and authority was going to be taken away. And they weren't interested in that. They couldn't care less about God. And that is the history of the church. You look at the history of revivals. When the Spirit comes in power, you will see division in the church. It happens every time. You will see speak people speaking in opposition to it. They won't have it. They don't want it. They want to control everything. You think you can control the wind? So it is with God and the Spirit. We need to welcome it. We need to lay ourselves down and say, come, Holy Spirit, transform us, use us. Why not? And so, after Lazarus has been raised from the dead, we see something else interesting. This is another symbolic manifestation of what God's power over sin and death looks like, of what it means to be individual upon whom his power has come. Because many were going out to see, well, many went out to Bethany, not only to see Jesus, but also to see Lazarus, whom he raised from the dead. So the Pharisees said, oh, that, isn't that amazing? That the authentic manifestation of the power of Christ in someone's life will bring persecution. Because he is the evidence that God is who he says he is. We are to be evidence that God is who he says he is so that he might show himself to be holy through us. I find that we live in a culture which has for years, decried risk. Risk is bad. Oh, we've got to have risk assessment. Watch out, your shoelaces aren't done properly. Don't go anywhere, you might trip over. This attitude and culture is the antithesis of Christianity. If you only ever operate within the confines of what you are able to do without the power of God, taking no risk, how on earth is God going to show up? What opportunity does he have to appear? You have already written him out of the contract before you began. It's like the disciples, if they had stayed where they were and left Jesus to go to Judea, they would never have seen Lazarus raised from the dead. A riskless Christianity is not very commendable. We have to take risks. We have to step out in faith. We have to confront the enemy which is trying to prevent us from taking that step of faith. The voice of Satan which starts telling you to keep quiet. They don't want to hear it. Don't say anything. It won't be appreciated. Who hasn't heard that? Who hasn't been in a situation and thought and that the, the thought presents itself, how am I going to testify to these people? And then you've got Satan saying, you don't want to be doing that. They won't listen. They won't hear what you've got to say. You'll just upset them and create hostility. Well, I have to say, well, you know, so what if you do? <laughs> Sometimes, 
receiving the law, he comes down to engage in idolatry, and he goes back up and pleads with the Lord not to destroy them. And then ultimately, God says this really interesting thing. He says, look, I'm going to send you into the promised land. I'm going to send my angel ahead of you. I'm going to deliver what I said I would deliver. But guess what? I'm not coming because you're a wicked and rebellious people and I might might, might flare up and I destroy you in a moment. Now most people would say, great, we're going to get all the benefits without the hassle. Who needs God with us if we're going to get the promised land? <laughs> Moses did not say that. He said, listen, if you don't come with us, how will the people of the other lands know that they're any different from anybody else unless your presence is with us? How are people going to know that the power of the living God, the raising of the dead, the forgiveness of sins is real unless the manifestation of the Spirit is testifying to it through us in the power that comes from God? And how does that come? It comes through interceding, through praying, through people getting together and seeking the face of God. That's what happened to the apostles. Imagine you'd seen everything they saw, including the resurrection of Jesus, after which they were still not capable of going out and proclaiming the message. It was only after Pentecost that things changed, that they were transformed. And surely, Ezekiel speaks first to the bones, and then they speak. He's told to prophesy to them. I, I have a friend called Medea in Malawi who used to cycle to this place where he, this village where he was going to start a church. And he'd cycle something like 30 kilometers with a bicycle with one pedal. So if there was no pedal on the other side, <laughs> he'd go to some ridiculous hour in the morning. And when he got there, he'd stand on what he called his preaching point and he'd just preach into the darkness. There was no one there. <laughs> and that reminds me a little bit of preach to these bones. The bones start rattling and flesh comes upon them. And they look like people, but they're still not alive. And then he says, preach some more, and the spirit of the living God comes upon them. And they stand up with great armor. Surely that's what we need. That's what I need. Anyway, that's enough for today, children. Let's pray. Father, we know, Lord, our own weaknesses, each one of us, Lord. And, and in fact, Lord, even our, our lack of zeal, Lord, you, you declare, blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. It is a blessing, Lord. We ask that you would bless us, Lord, so that we would be minded, Lord, to be filled with your glory. If that's a splendid thing, Father, we Thank you, Lord God, for delivering to us such a splendid salvation that death and sin have been destroyed, immortality brought to life. Help us to see beyond the horizon of this life, Lord. Forgive us, Lord, for being so easily distracted. Help us to fix our minds, Lord. Give us a heart that loves you completely, Lord God. Oh, may we love you with all our heart, soul, strength, mind, Lord God. Help us in this, we pray. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for bearing with us. We ask that you would be pleased to come amongst us and, and to minister to us. And to greatly revive us, Lord. So that we might see more clearly the glory of the salvation that you have set before us and the reality of the kingdom. And may that 